Section six of the Destination of Man by Johann Gottlieb Fichte. Translated by Jane Sinnott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter six Knowledge Idea of Causality. The character I read by Kevin S spirit read by larry wilson sweet or bitter rough or smooth cold or warm an agreeable or disagreeable smell signifies nothing more than what awakens in me this or that sensation and the case is the same with respect to sounds a relation to myself is always indicated and it never occurs to me that the sweet or bitter taste the pleasant or unpleasant smell lies in the thing itself it lies in me and is only excited by the presence of the object it appears indeed as if the case might be different with the affection of the sight such as colors which might not be pure sensations but something intermediate yet when we think well of it red blue and so on mean nothing more than what produces a certain sensation of sight this leads me to conjecture how i may attain to a knowledge of things outside of myself i am affected in a certain manner this i know absolutely and my affection must have a cause which does not exist in me and must consequently exist out of me i reason thus instantaneously and involuntarily and assume the existence of such a cause in the object this cause must necessarily be one from which my sensation can be explained i am affected in a certain manner which i call a sweet taste and the object must therefore be of a kind to awaken a sweet taste or by a more rapid form of speech must be sweet and in this manner i determine the object there is some truth in this although it is not the whole truth what this is may perhaps appear in due time since however in other cases as well as this thou wilt return incontestably to this idea of a cause we will endeavour to render perfectly clear what is really meant by it we will admit that the assertion is perfectly correct that by an involuntary course of reasoning from the effect to the cause thou hast first attained to a knowledge of the object what then was it of which thou wert conscious in perception of being affected in a certain manner but of an object affecting thee in a certain manner thou wast not conscious in perception by no means i have already admitted this by this idea of causality therefore thou art enabled to add to a knowledge which thou hast another which thou hast not the expression is strange perhaps i may succeed in rendering it less so let my expressions however appear to thee as they may they are intended merely to lead thee to produce in thine own mind the same train of thoughts that i have produced in mine when thou hast mastered the idea express it as thou wilt and with as much variety as possible and to be sure that thou wilt always express it well how and by what means dost thou know of this affection of thyself i know not how to answer thee in words because my subjective consciousness as far as i am an intelligent being is inseparably united with this knowledge because i am no further conscious than as i am aware of these affections thou hast therefore an organ or faculty that of consciousness by which thou perceivest these affections i have but an organ or faculty by which thou perceivest the existence of the object in itself thou hast not since thou hast convinced me that i neither see nor feel the object itself nor embrace it with any external organ i find myself compelled to confess that i have not consider well of this admission what is an external sense in general and how can it be external if it does not take cognizance of the external object but only of the affections or states of thine own being i do distinguish green sweet red smooth bitter rough the sound of a violin and of a trumpet among these sensations i discover in some a certain similarity although in some other respects i perceive their difference thus green and red though different are both sensations of sight rough and smooth of touch sweet and bitter of taste sight taste and so forth are not in themselves sensations 
for i never see or feel absolutely but always as thou hast already remarked see red or green taste sweet or bitter etc sight and taste are only higher forms or classes to which i refer the immediate sensations i see in them no external senses for they take cognizance only of the modifications of the inward sense of the affections of my being how i come to regard them as external senses is the question for i do not take back my assertion that i have no organ for the object itself thou speakest nevertheless of objects as if by some organ their existence were really known to thee i do so and this according to thy previous assumption in consequence of a knowledge which thou really dost possess and for which thou hast an organ and for the sake of this knowledge it is so thy real knowledge that of thy sensations or affections is to thee like an imperfect knowledge which requires to be completed by another this other new kind of knowledge thou hast described to thyself not as what thou hast but as what thou shouldst have if it were not that thou hast no organ by which to attain it i know nothing indeed thou seemest to say of things existing out of myself but they must nevertheless exist if i could but find them a relation is thus formed with them in thought by means of a supposed faculty which nevertheless thou dost not possess strictly speaking thou hast no consciousness of things in themselves but only by means of the idea of causality a consciousness of which should be a consciousness of things but which does not really belong to thee thou wilt therefore admit that to a knowledge which thou hast thou hast added another which thou hast not i must allow this we will call this second knowledge obtained by means of another immediate and the first an immediate knowledge the latter presents itself to thee simultaneously with the consciousness of existence the former is deduced from it it is not however successive to it in time for i am conscious of the object at the same moment in which i am conscious of myself i did not speak of a succession in time my meaning was that when thou couldst distinguish by reflection thy consciousness of thyself from that of the object and inquire about their connection thou wouldst discover that the former was the necessary condition of the latter which depended wholly upon it if this be all i have already admitted as much the second consciousness i repeat is produced engendered by a real act of the mind or dost thou find it otherwise i do indeed add to the consciousness of sensation which is simultaneous with that of existence another which i do not find in myself and as by this i double and complete my real consciousness i may be said to perform a mental act i am however tempted either to take back my admission or the whole supposition i am perfectly conscious of performing a mental act when i form a universal conception when in doubtful cases i choose one of various possible modes of action which lie before me of the mental act however which according to thy assertion i perform in the representation of an object out of myself i am not conscious at all do not be deceived of these acts of the mind thou art only conscious by proceeding through previous states of irresolution and indetermination to which these acts put an end in the case i have supposed there is no previous indecision the mind has no need of deliberation concerning the object producing a definite sensation an act of the mind of which we are conscious as such is called freedom an act without consciousness of action is called spontaneity i by no means assume as necessary any immediate consciousness of the act but merely that on subsequent reflection thou shouldst perceive it to be an act the higher question of what it is that prevents any such state of indecision or any consciousness of the act we may perhaps subsequently be able to solve this act of the mind is called thought a word which i also shall employ and it is said that thought is a spontaneous act to distinguish it from sensation in which the mind is merely receptive and passive how then does it happen that to the sensation which thou certainly hast thou addest in thy thought an object of which thou knowest nothing i assume as certain that my sensation must have a cause wilt thou then not explain to me what is a cause 
i find a certain thing determined this way or that i am not content with knowing that it is so i assume that it has become so and that not by and through itself only but by means of a power outside of itself this foreign power that made it what it is contains then its cause that my sensation must have a cause means merely that it must be produced in me by a force out of myself this force or cause thou addest in thought to the sensation of which thou art immediately conscious and thus arises in thee the conception of an object let it be so but now take notice if thy sensation must have a cause i admit the correctness of the inference and i see with what perfect right is assumed the existence of things out of thyself of which thou knowest nothing but how then dost thou know and how can it be proved that thy sensation must have a cause or in the more general manner in which thou hast stated the proposition why canst thou not be satisfied to know that something is why must thou assume that it has become so or that it has become so by means of an extraneous force i cannot avoid thinking thus it seems as if i knew this immediately what this answer thou knowest it immediately may signify we shall see if we are brought back to it as to the only possible one we will however first try all other methods of obtaining by reasoning the grounds of the assertion that everything must have a cause dost thou know this by immediate perception how could i since in perception there is nothing more than a consciousness that in me something is by no means however that it has become so far less that it has become so by an extraneous force lying beyond the limits of perception or is this idea obtained by generalizing thy observation of things out of thyself whose cause thou hast invariably discovered to lie out of themselves and applying this observation subsequently to thyself and the various states of thine own being do not treat me like a child and ascribe to me evident absurdities by the idea of cause i first arrive at a knowledge of the existence of things out of myself how then can i by observation of these things obtain the idea of a cause shall the earth rest on the great elephant and the great elephant again upon the earth is then this idea deduced from another general truth which again could be found neither in immediate perception nor in the observation of external things and concerning the origin of which thou wouldst start further questions i must say i obtain this fundamental truth by immediate knowledge it is better that i should say this at once of the idea of causality let it be so we should then obtain besides the first immediate knowledge by sensation another immediate knowledge concerning a general truth this knowledge that thy sensation must have a cause is entirely independent of the knowledge of the things in themselves certainly for the latter is obtained only by means of it and thou hast it absolutely in thyself absolutely for only by means of it can i proceed out of myself out of thyself therefore and through thyself thou prescribest laws to existence and their relations if i wish to speak accurately i must say that i prescribe laws to the images of these existences and their relations which are formed in my own mind be it so art thou conscious of these laws in any other manner than by acting in accordance with them my consciousness of them begins with that of sensation my representation of an object according to the law of causality is simultaneous with a sensation both the consciousness of my own state and the representation of the object producing it are inseparably united no consciousness occurs between these two and it is impossible that i should be conscious of this law previously to acting in accordance with it thou actest in accordance with this law therefore unconsciously and instantaneously yet but a short time since thou didst declare thyself conscious of it and expressed it as a general proposition how is this doubtless thus i observe my own mind subsequently to having thus acted and comprehend these observations in one general proposition thou canst therefore become conscious of these acts most certainly i can and i divine thy intention in asking this question this is the above-mentioned second kind of immediate consciousness 
that of my actions as the first is that of my sensation or passive states right thou canst become conscious of thine own act subsequently by free observation of thyself and by reflection thou art not however immediately conscious of it in acting i must be so for i am conscious of my representation of the object at the same moment as of its sensation i have discovered the solution i am immediately conscious of my act only not as such for it presents itself to me as a consciousness of the object subsequently by free reflection i become conscious of this as of the act of my own mind my immediate consciousness is twofold consisting of a consciousness of a state of suffering which is sensation and of action in the representation of an object according to the law of causality the latter consciousness being immediately connected with the former my consciousness of the object is only a yet unrecognized consciousness of my production of the representation of an object of this production i know no more than that it is i who produce and thus is all consciousness no more than a consciousness of myself and so far perfectly comprehensible am i in the right perfectly so but whence then is derived the necessity and universality thou hast ascribed to these propositions to that of causality for instance from the immediate feeling that i cannot act otherwise as long as i have reason and that no other reasonable being can act otherwise when i say that all that is contingent such as my sensation must have a cause i mean that a cause always was is and will be conceived by me and by every thinking being in a similar case it appears then that all thy knowledge is merely a knowledge of thyself that thy consciousness never proceeds beyond thyself and that what thou hast regarded as a consciousness of the real existence of the object is no more than a consciousness of thine own representation or conception of an object produced according to an inward law of thought and necessarily coexisting with thy sensation end of section six